never doubt your faith. I think you're always on a journey. You're trying to learn and grow and understand. And you're not always strong. You're not always in the right position. It's, we're all on a journey. Let's go! I have to go this way. Who's ready? I just saw that over there and I was like, I'm just, I just need to write it. Off-road, man. I, I get excited about going off-road, and we're talking in this series about off-road and our faith and all of that and what it really takes to have this growing faith. And I think about faith in so many ways in riding a motorcycle. In our topic today, when you look at what we're talking about today, it's like this is a topic that for some people, if they're riding the adventure bike of faith, this is something that can knock them over. And so I wanna get this to you. And I want you to really grasp it and understand it, absorb it, and learn from it today. But first, how many of you are tired of voting? <laughs> I got one more thing I need you to vote on. Get your phones out, if you would. My book is just about to be released. So finally, my book is coming out. I need you to vote on the cover of the book, seriously. I know you're like, what are you talking about? Seriously, I, we're down to the last couple things that we need figured out for the book. So let's take a look. Here's my book, How It All Ends. And this is the book I've been telling you is coming when we did the End Times series. I said I'm gonna be writing a book on it. And we're down to the final kind of ideas on it. Do you like the blue or the red? Yeah, I don't, you, I don't know what you just said. So I need you to text, vote to 94,000 and tell me, it'll come up, it'll be one or a two a blue or a red, and just vote real quick and you're gonna see how it's changing. Right now from the other service on Thursday, they like the red. So all campuses, we welcome in our Lakeside campus, we welcome in Tennessee, we welcome in all our online family, including Mike in Pahrump, Nevada, a member of ours in Pahrump. Let's welcome them in as we vote. You see it changing as you vote. Red is winning again. All right, yeah, yeah, some of you are getting it. Some of you is a little, it's an early service. <laughs> Need some coffee. Let's just go by show of hands. How many like the blue? Ra raise your hand. Okay, how many like the red? Yeah. Wow, I think it's getting clear. Thank you guys for doing that. I think it's appreciate it. Because I was going blue all the way and then, then I just had this last minute idea. I don't know, man. Let me put it in red. And everyone likes red. Not everyone, but most people. Okay. Thank you guys for doing that, that helps me. And uh, our staff and team helped me with the title of the book and literally it's for anyone, a beginner's guide to really understanding Revelation, Bible prophecy and the end of the world. You can hand it to someone, they'll be able to get it and understand. It's really a simple, uh, simple way I went about it. So having said all that, let's jump into our topic today. As I mentioned about you know, riding the bike out here and the whole thing about faith and it's easy for us to stumble over this issue when God says no. Why does he sometimes say no to us? And I think as I process this, not only am I living it and have lived it, and so many of you have, this is so monumental to building a strong faith. So monumental to understanding what rugged faith really is. What does it mean? Not just have faith, because a lot of people say they have faith. But what does it mean to have rugged faith? A faith that is so strong that we're truly able to trust in the Lord through everything. 
That's what we really wanna talk about because you probably either heard people say or you've said it yourself. I tried prayer. I, I, I said prayers and you know, I didn't get any answer, I didn't see any results, so I don't really believe in prayer. And sometimes people will say that. They say, I'm disappointed, I don't believe in it. And as you look at that, if we're honest, we'd probably say there are many prayers that go up and maybe, the, maybe few answers that we like that come back. That's tough, why is that? Is prayer something we just con ourselves into? As Christians, that we just kinda go, yeah, I think it works, I don't know, make ourselves feel better, no. I mean, we gotta look at this, what is prayer? Why does God sometimes say no? And I think there's a deeper question. Does God promise to answer every single person's prayer? And the answer to that is no, he doesn't. As a matter of fact, there are some people he completely ignores. And I wanna make sure you understand this. Sometimes, um, if you don't meet the conditions for answered prayer, you're wasting your breath. So as I look at this, I want you to understand a couple of things. One, there are at least five conditions to answered prayer. And the first condition, and I didn't put these in your notes, it's gonna be real quick. Just keep this in mind, because some of you are gonna go, yeah, that's one, maybe that's why I feel like there's a ceiling when I pray. One is you can't have any unconfessed sin in your life. Is there something you're holding on to that you need to confess to the Lord? Okay, that'll block prayer. That's one. Another is I have to want to know God's will. God's will is found in God's word. So I have to have a desire to really know what his will is. And if I'm not seeking his will through his word, he has no obligation to answer my prayer. Another one is I can't have any unforgiveness in my heart. If I have unforgiveness towards someone, God says work that out first. Get that taken care of before I'm going to answer that prayer of yours. That's important. I can't ignore any of the principles of his word, that means I have to be willing to listen to God first. I have to be willing to hear what he has to say to me before I'm just always talking and telling him what I need and want and desire. Those are some of the conditions. And if I'm not doing that, if I don't really have an honest relationship with God, like, God, what do you want me to do in this life? And I'm digging into your word and I'm applying your principles and yes, I wanna do this and I, want, I really wanna do what you want. Then I go to him with some prayer request it's like he's my chauffeur or my butler instead of the living God. But let's say you're in line with all those. There's no box there that you can check. You know, you're not like struggling with any of those and you're going, and this is a legitimate request, Lord. Why does he not answer us the way we like? Maybe you felt like Job. I cry to you, oh God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. If you've been a Christian very long, you've probably felt that. You've probably had that sense of, hello, you know, I'm doing things right, trying to live my life for you. Where's my answer? I have to admit, man, the most confusing aspect, one of the most confusing aspects of my 33 years of being a Christian is this issue. Why does God answer some prayers and not others? If I'm living right, again, not violating conditions of answered prayer, why doesn't God answer us? For some people, it's what about those times you prayed for a job or you prayed for a promotion and you don't get it? What about people that pray that their spouse won't leave and the spouse still walks out the door? What about people that are praying for somebody to marry? God, send me that person. And they never come. They just never show up. And when it comes to some things that are based on other people's free will, obviously God doesn't force his will on anybody. There's free will. That means there's free choice. That means people make choices that end up hurting us. And sometimes we make choices that hurt others. God doesn't force you to do the right thing. Sometimes we pray, God, make them do the right thing. And they still walk out. And they still do the wrong thing because he doesn't force it on anybody. But what about those times that don't involve free will? Why do some people get miracles and other people don't? Why do some people pray for sick people and they get well, others pray for sick people and they die? Why do some people pray to have children and they get them? And some people pray to have children and they don't get them. Why do some people who don't pray for children get them? When there's people praying for them. 
You just go, what is going on in this whole thing? Some people pray for relief from pain, and they get it instantly. Other people pray, and they never get free from chronic pain. These are tough, real questions. The Bible says that God wants to answer your prayers. Rugged faith believes that. If you're gonna have strong faith, a rugged faith that can go over anything, climb any mountain, you won't get tipped over in the difficulties of life, then you have to believe that God wants to answer your prayer. Jeremiah 33, three says it like this, call to me and I might answer you. What does it say? Yeah, it says I will answer you, I will. God says he wants to answer you. And over 20 times in the New Testament we're told to ask. Look at this verse. Ask, it shall be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. But honestly, it just sometimes seems like God's not listening, like heaven is silent. So what is the problem? Well, the fact is, God always answers our prayers, but not in the way we always think, not even necessarily in the way we want, and that's the hardest part. Because when we want it to be answered in a certain way, if you've been a Christian very long, you know God answers in three ways. There's yes that we love. We love the yes. <sighs> Got it. There's the not yet. We think it's a no sometimes, but God just says it's a not yet. And we have to remember that a delay is not a denial. It's just you're in that not yet time. You're in the delay time. But it's not necessarily a no, and that's the last one. Sometimes he says no. He says, I got a different idea. I got something else I'm gonna do. And that's the, that, those are the ones that are really hard for us. But we see all throughout scripture examples of not yets and no's. Not yet, you can just point to Joseph in the Old Testament when Joseph was falsely in prison for two years. He's in a dungeon. And you, can you imagine his prayer? God, I didn't do anything to deserve this. When are you gonna get me out of here? Please get me out. And the answer isn't coming because God was doing something else until that two year mark was up. There's so many examples of that. A lot of examples of the no's. You can talk about Moses, Abraham, King David, Daniel, the Apostle Paul, you can go on and on. Key biblical figures that love God with all their heart, yet God said no to their prayers. So if they got a no, I got a figure that I'm gonna get a no pretty often too. And that's what rugged faith is, is about. It's understanding that. You read the book of Job, and that's a guy that went through it. If you ever feel like you're struggling, go to the book of Job, and you'll be like, I'm, it's not so bad. You know, thank you, Lord, I'm okay. Don't do what you did to Job. Please, thank you. But you look at this whole message summarized. It can be summarized in Job 13, 15. This is rugged faith. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. No matter how tough it gets, I don't understand the no, I'm gonna follow you. Because I believe overall, you know what's best. That's the ultimate test of rugged faith. Will you hope in him when he says no? And the thing that confuses us is that if God is loving, and we know he is, and if God is all powerful, and we know that he is, then why does he sometimes Seemingly, he denies my good and fair requests. I'm not asking God to make me a gazillionaire. I don't think you are. Asking God to make you a gazillionaire so you can you know, have a lavish lifestyle. It's some simple things sometimes. Good, legitimate prayer. Why does he sometimes say no? I'm gonna give you a few reasons, and if you can grasp these reasons, if you can hold on to these, you see these, you write them down, you hold on to them. When that inevitable no or not yet comes in your life, you're gonna be able to go, okay. See, God didn't tell you you have to like it, but he does tell us you have to trust it. And that's a really difficult time sometimes. But if you grasp these, you will ride the great adventure of faith and you'll ride over any rugged thing that comes along. If you don't grasp what I'm gonna tell you today, Eventually, if not sooner than later, your faith will tip over, you'll crash. You have to grasp this. You have to understand this to have a strong, rugged faith. Why does God sometimes say no? Number one, I want you to write this down. 
God's perspective spans eternity. Ours is bound by time. God's perspective, he sees it all. He sees how this is going to affect that. We don't see it. All we can see is right in front of us. Matter of fact, you got a straw when you came in all campuses. I want you to take this straw. Just humor me for a moment, okay? I know some of you are like, when do we have a straw? Are they doing iced coffee? No, listen, just do this for me. Just look through the straw. Just look through it. All campuses, online, go get a straw from your drawer. Listen, see how little, you can see, right? Everyone can see. You can see through it, but you see a tiny bit. All we could see is bound by the walls of this straw. This is life. This is all we see. This is our perspective. Now God, let's just take this room for example, whatever campus you're at, look at the room. You look at the room. You look around the room, this is God's view. He sees everything. He sees everything from the past, present and future all at once. That, that just is mind blowing to think about. So his perspective is so much bigger. Ours is this little straw because all we see is right now. We see right in front of us, that's it. And his sees the whole thing, how it affects everything. Look at Hebrews 4.13, it says it like this. He knows about everyone everywhere. Everything about us is bare wide open to the all seeing eyes of our, our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him. That's nothing from the past, nothing from the present, nothing from the future can be hidden from him because he sees it all at once. He knows it all. When God says no, it's often because of his perspective. Our immediate doesn't line up with his ultimate. That's a big faith thing that we have to understand. Sometimes his no is leading us towards a yes that will come in his timing. Now when it comes to prayer, one of our big problems is we cannot see the consequences down the road of our prayer requests. And because we're limited, we need God's bigger eternal perspective when we pray. We actually need him to say no sometimes. Proverbs 2.8 says it like this, God guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Sometimes we don't realize it, but he's actually protecting us from something else. You can drive yourself crazy trying to figure out why God said no, but usually we just have to trust and say you got a bigger perspective on this thing. And sometimes it's really hard when you lose a loved one because then you're going, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. I can't ever make that make sense. But yet God is saying, look, you don't know how the loss of that loved one might be bringing more and more people to Christ. You don't know how in eternity that loss is gonna be a huge gain because of his perspective. He has a bigger perspective and you're gonna get to eternity and go, oh, I see now. And hopefully you don't fall off the bike in the meantime. God guards the courts and the just protects the way of his faithful ones. That's what he wants to do. All I'm doing is looking through a straw. And you look at that and there are times all throughout scripture. This is why if you're in scripture consistently, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to see someone like Daniel who is gonna be thrown into the lion's den because he's faithful to God. This guy is getting punished because he prays three times a day to the Lord and because he wasn't praying to the king. And so he's getting thrown into the lion's den and he's praying, I don't wanna go, Lord. I've been doing everything you want me to do. You're throw me in the lion's den? You gotta go in the lion's den? I'm imagining that's probably kind of his reaction. He gets thrown in there and God shuts the mouths of the lions. Comes out and everybody falls down and worships the Lord. Bigger perspective. Or what about in the same book of Daniel? You had those three young, wise men that loved the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I like to remember them as your shack, my shack, and a Winnebago. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I always, when I see that, I always go there. And so they don't want to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. They refuse, ah, <laughs> Nebuch that just comes out every time. To Nebuch but it's, it's, there's a lot of similarities if you read, All right? Because he put up a statue and he wanted everybody to bow down to in the book of Daniel and he told these three guys, if you don't bow down, 
I'm gonna throw you in the fiery furnace. And so they don't. They said, we're gonna pray. And if God has us go into the fiery furnace, he does. But I can tell you this, we're not bowing down to your statue. And they stood up. And they said, no. And so guess what? He got so mad, he threw him in. He, he you know, heated up the furnace seven times hotter and threw those guys in. They were bound. Well, the, the fire burned the ropes off, but they were untouched. And the Bible says, and there was a fourth walking around in the fire. We know that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Protected them, got them out. And when Nebuchadnezzar saw them, he realized your God is the God. And that whole nation started to worship the one true God. Sometimes that perspective, we don't understand it. We don't wanna go through that fire. We don't wanna be put in the lion's den. But there's a bigger perspective in play. And if we can trust that, it'll make all the difference. We see it all throughout scripture. Secondly, not only is it because God's eternal, has an eternal purpose involved in all this, but he always has a better plan than we can come up with. God always has a better plan of what he's, he's going after here. We think as we pray this, this is a great plan, Lord. <laughs> I've got this figured out. And God's like, eh, I got a better one. As a matter of fact, sometimes he says, I'm gonna answer your request, but I'm gonna do it in a different way than you imagined. It's gonna be different. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Isaiah, this plan of mine is not what you would work out. Why? Because we don't have his perspective. Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. He's going eternal, we're bound by time. My ways, my plans are higher than yours. He's saying, trust me in this. And notice this. He says, ways, my ways. In other words, we say a prayer request. He has multiple ways that he can answer that request. We're only thinking of one sometimes. Let's say, for instance, we just came out of this generosity series, and let's say you're in financial trouble, and you're saying, God, get me out of debt. Now, there's a myriad of ways that God could get you out of debt. One, he could just have a boatload of money show up in your mail. Now, that's the way we all want it to go, but that's probably not gonna happen. He, he could give you a promotion at work. You could start earning more income. He could help you think through how to manage money better. He can cut your expenses. And the one promise when we're generous, he says, I'll make what you have last longer. I can go through the list, 15, 20, 30, 40 ways that he can answer that request for you. He's got a bunch of ways to answer the request. And when we trust him, his plan is better than any kind of plan you and I could come up with. But it takes rugged faith to really trust and believe that. It's a powerful reminder. And as you look at that, you think about this. Most of us, when we pray a prayer, we want it in the quickest and convenient way possible. When we're praying to God, I've never heard someone say, Lord, take as long as possible and make it so hard that it really grows me up in character. Like you just don't hear that. Right, what is it? I want it now, I need it now. That's the kind of, that's, that's the, a lot of people only pray when it's needed now, when it's needed immediately. There is no room for character growth. There's no room in our minds and our hearts for what something else God might wanna do because we're just thinking now. Because again, we see God as our butler in a lot of ways, as our vending machine. Put in a prayer, get an answer out. And maybe you say, well, how do I get through this hard time? And, and what you have to understand, if you are a Christian, when you said yes to, to the Lord Jesus Christ, you signed up for a character course. You signed up for a lifetime character course. We thought initially that we signed up for heaven, right? I'm going to heaven, and that's true. If you said yes to the, G, to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to heaven. But what you also signed up for, which is why he said count the cost, is you signed up for a lifetime course in character building. Now, a lot of us don't like that. We don't like that part. Just, I just want the heaven part. And then I wanna live my life however I want. And God said, that's not what you signed up for. <laughs> And so we have to be reminded of that, you know? 
But how do you get through it? Well, you do like Jesus did. Jesus knew he would be resurrected, but he also knew of the really difficult time that was coming, and so he asked the Lord, the Father. He said, please allow this cup of suffering to pass from me. But he said something really important after that, because as you and I think about the tough times that we go through, it's okay to ask him to remove it. I don't wanna go through it. (laughs) Help me, Lord. But this is what we have to come to. We have to come to this point in our faith development. Not my will, read it with me, but yours be done. That's what Jesus said. He was leaving us an example. Just as Jesus knew he would be resurrected, you and I know we're gonna be resurrected. And this time that we're going through, as difficult as it is, and we don't understand it, we have to trust that his plan eternally is better than mine. It's better than what I could come up with. It's why Job was saying, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, we talked about it last week, just the last part. God had planned something better. His plan is better and rugged faith understands that. And I could tell you, looking back on my life, there are so many times I'm so grateful that he said no. Can you think of times in your life? If you've ever been to a high school reunion, you can think of times you're like, thank you, Lord. (laughs) Woo, dodged a bullet. Okay, you know? But there are other (laughs) times we look at that. God, God always has a better plan. And when you say that, you have rugged faith. Here's the third one, because God's purpose is greater. So he's got a better plan, which leads to a greater purpose. That's the key, is understanding that. When I can say, I want it to go this way, but God says, no, I'm gonna take it that way. I say, okay, I can trust your plan because I'm trusting in your greater purpose, which goes back to understanding you have a bigger perspective that you think eternally instead of temporarily. So Proverbs 16, four says like this, the Lord has made everything for his own purposes. God's purpose, again, is eternal. Ours is temporary. He has a purpose behind everything that happens. Everything. He has a purpose. Even unanswered prayer or delayed answers or no's. And listen, this is rugged faith. He's not obligated to tell me why. He's not obligated to ask me ahead of time, Jeremy, you cool if I do it this way? (laughs) He's not obligated to, once it happens, him going, well, here, Jeremy, here's why I did that, and here's the whole plan overall, and I just, I wanna get your approval on it. That's not the way it works, because that makes me God, not him. He's God, he's in charge, I follow. That's what we do as Christians. We follow even when it's tough, but he's trying to build us a rugged faith that can go over anything and go through anything, and one day we can ask, When we see him face to face, we can say, I don't understand about this and I don't understand. And as soon as he speaks a word, we're gonna go, oh, got it. Now I understand. But he wants us to focus on the eternal, not the temporary. Now, sometimes we just have problems and we're praying for these problems to be removed. But what is the purpose in our problems? Look what it says here. The purpose of these troubles is to test your faith. As fire tests how genuine gold is, your faith is more precious than gold. So sometimes you're going through something, it's actually a test of your faith. There are times when God wants to test the genuineness of your faith and mine. He wants to test it. And so you may be going through some problems, you're asking that those problems be removed, it's a test. Are you gonna fall off the bike? Are you gonna go, okay, Lord, I don't like it, but I wanna learn from it, I wanna grow from it, I wanna get closer to you through this, not farther away from you, And just like gold goes through the fire so that the impurities come to the top and it's scooped off, it's known as dross, the impurities are scooped off and that gold is used for noble purposes. It's the same thing God's trying to do in us. Sometimes troubles are what brings out the dross. He wants to scoop it off and get rid of it. It's like every parent has said to a child sometimes. When when you tell your kid no, 
And you parents know this. You told them no, and they say what? Why? But why? And sometimes your answer to that is, because I said so. That's our answer sometimes. And what are we saying to them? I'm wiser than you. I'm older than you. I have more experience than you. And I don't have to sit here and explain my no to you. Sometimes, kid, you just got to trust daddy. That's what we're saying when we say that. And you know what? Sometimes that's what God says. That no, and we're going, why, 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 why? And he's just going, you just got to trust me on this one. You're going to have to trust me on this one. Not easy, but you're going to have to trust me. And I have no doubt during this service and at all of our campuses and those of you watching online, some of you, maybe you're discouraged about prayer today. Maybe you're discouraged about a prayer you've prayed over and over and over and it just hasn't come true. It just hasn't come, you feel like God hasn't come through. Maybe you've prayed to get rid of physical pain. That seems to be a common one these days. Or maybe you prayed you want your marriage to get better. You fill in the blank. And here's what God's saying through that. Will you trust me? Will you trust my timing? Will you trust my love? Will you trust my purpose and my plan and my perspective? Will you? Will you trust me? Rugged faith. Look at this verse right here. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our inner strength in the Lord is growing every day. That's his intent. As we get older in the faith, it's not automatic that we get stronger in the faith. You have to be intentional about your growth. The goal though, as our bodies are decaying and wasting away, is that we're actually getting stronger spiritually. These troubles and sufferings of ours are, after all, this is something quite small and won't last very long. And some of you are going, well, it feels like it's lasting a long time. But what he's saying is, in light of eternity, it's not. The Bible calls our time here a mist that appears for a little while. And he's saying, your troubles that you're dealing with in light of eternity, ha, huh, nothing. Very small, in a short time, this short time of distress will result in God's richest blessing upon us forever and ever. It goes on. So we don't look at what we can see right now. Here's, he comes back to the straw idea. We don't look at this right now. He says, we don't look at all we could see right now because if this is all I can see right now, I'm gonna be a frustrated Christian. If that's all I go off of is my limited perspective, I'm gonna be a sad Christian. I'm gonna be a joyless Christian. He says, if we go off all we can see right now, the trouble's all around us, but we look forward to the joys of heaven. This is what's happening. All that we're struggling with, it's only gonna help us enjoy heaven where there's no death, no suffering, and the Padres win the World Series every year, which we have not yet seen. The troubles will soon be over. You're like, what about all the Dodger fans? They're not gonna be there. <laughs> oh, sorry, all right, hold on. The troubles will soon be over, but the joys to come, it's gonna last forever. He's saying if you keep that perspective and if you really grasp this, every pain we're going through, all the difficulties we're struggling with right now, he goes, it's not gonna matter in eternity. You're gonna be like, oh, it was worth it. It was worth the struggle to enjoy heaven for eternity. Now, sometimes God allows you to go through pain for the benefit of other people, and we have to understand this. As I was processing this message, I thought, man, there's so many people that have struggled and are struggling and all this stuff. And here at our church, we literally have hundreds of different ministries. And I want you to think about this. Some of them have been started by people in our church. Others, we're partnered with people. But here's the thing. These different ministries care for every kind of imaginable problem crisis situation and life stage, just name it. And we have a ministry for it. And I got to thinking about these ministries and realized almost every one of those was started by somebody in this church who went through a problem, a pain, a heartache, and they prayed and God said no. They asked God for relief from the pain, he said no. I'm going to let you go through the pain because I want you to be a blessing to other people. So you're gonna go through this problem, you're gonna learn from it, and you're gonna help others who are going through the same problem. That's what he does sometimes. When we signed up for the character course and we signed up for God to use us, we maybe didn't expect 
that we'd have to go through some of the things we've had to go through. But it's not without purpose. If you're grieving, who is the best person to help somebody else grieve? (laughs) Somebody who's gone through the pain of grief. Who is the best person to help someone overcome an addiction? Someone who's been through the pain of addiction. You go through the list. God says, I'm not gonna waste your hurt. He never wastes a hurt. Now, I put these in your notes already because I want you to hold on to these in case you missed the fill-in. I just decided I'm gonna put them in your notes. If you want more peace in life, if you want less stress, here's a couple things you have to understand. Number one, some things I'm never going to understand this side of heaven. I'm not God. I don't understand everything. And I'm not gonna understand everything this side of heaven. If I can just have that perspective, it's gonna help me a lot to go, okay. Deuteronomy 29, 29 reminds us there are secrets the Lord your God has not revealed to us. <laughs> to no one. And we won't know, all right? There's just some things I'm never gonna understand. And I have to be able to chalk that up and go, I don't understand it, I'm never gonna. Not until I get to heaven. Number two, some things are not gonna change no matter how much I pray about them. Now, that's a tough one. Are you telling me, pastor, just not pray? That's not what I'm telling you. I'm just gonna tell you some things you're gonna pray about and they're not gonna change because of what we just talked about. Because if God has a different perspective, he sees eternally, not temporarily. He has a better plan and he has a greater purpose for all of it. Okay, so some things aren't gonna change. Doesn't mean you stop praying. You gotta keep that relational connection going. Here's the thing that I've learned. The closer you're connected to the Lord in prayer and in his word, the more you handle the nose. The more you handle his nose because you're able to go, okay, I don't get it. But Lord, I trust you. I have this relationship with you. You never let me down. So I'm gonna keep going. I trust, trust your word, trust what you're saying. See, prayer builds rugged faith. So you just keep on praying, but you live day by day saying, God, I'm gonna pray for this. If you choose not to give it, I'm still gonna trust you. I'm still gonna love you. And though you slay me, yet I will hope in you. That's rugged faith. So what do you do when you get a no? Here's what you do. When you get a no, because it's inevitable, we're all gonna get some no's, trust that everything God does is motivated by love. And you may not understand it. You're going, I don't see how that's motivated by love, but he's saying, trust me. And the overall, it's motivated by love because he always acts in love towards his children, even the painful things. Psalm 25, 10 says like this, all the ways of the Lord are what? Loving, all of them, not some of them, all of them, he says. Romans 8, 28, one of my favorite verses that's helped me get through a lot of hard times in 33 years of being a Christian. We know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God. It doesn't say that everything that happens to us is good. It says that he will work it out for good. Even the evil things that people do with their free choice to us. He says, I will work it out for good. Stay trusting, stay with it. All right, this is not, promise isn't for everyone, it's for people that love God. What happens is when God says no, listen now, I'll close up with this. When God says no, Satan comes in and tries to tell you that God doesn't love you. Satan comes in and says, see, I told you it was all a farce. He starts to try to plant seeds. God doesn't love you. It doesn't pay to serve God. You should be your own God. Forget God, forget church, forget Christianity, forget it all and live for for yourself because God's not gonna help you out. That's what he says in your ear. What's it worth? Listen to me. Satan is a liar. He will always lie to you because the truth is God loves you too much to give you everything you ask for. God knows what is right. He knows what'll help overall. So we have to trust that everything God does, even when he says no, I'm not gonna do that. He's doing it out of love. And here's the last one. I gotta ask God to give me the rugged faith to handle the no. At the end of the day, I just gotta say, God, give me that faith. God, I believe, as Thomas, as the Bible shared, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. When Jesus was gonna heal a man's son, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Sometimes that's all we got. That's all we got. And if it was good enough for that guy to heal his kid, it's good enough for us. Rugged faith, what is it? Sometimes it's simply the power to handle pain. 
The apostle Paul had to learn it. Look what, this, look what Paul said. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. He had some kind of handicap. He had some kind of issue, something he needed healing from, and he kept praying to the Lord. And he said, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. He struggled through this whole thing, and yet God didn't answer it. And he said, you'll be fine. I'm gonna give you enough grace to handle it. And sometimes that's all we get, and that's enough. So when God says no, we got to trust his bigger perspective, his better plan, his greater purpose. And and remember, it's all working together. And you have to think, if God put a Goliath in front of you, he knows there's a David inside of you. You're gonna get through it. You gotta trust him with it, trust him for that. Psalm 910, our last verse. Those who know your name trust you, O Lord, because you have never deserted those who seek your help. You may not understand it, but I wanna encourage you. Don't desert God, he hasn't deserted you. He'll show you as you go through it and you get your nose, it will build up your faith so that you have a rugged faith for the future, amen? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, we trust that, we trust that. See, the more that you know God, the more you're going to trust him. The more that you know God, the more you're gonna know that he has a bigger perspective, an eternal perspective while we're bound by time. So maybe today you need to get to know him. Maybe you've known about him, but today you need to get to know him. We call it the ABCs of salvation. The A is to admit you're a sinner. That means you've done some things wrong. You're just admitting it like every Christian has. B is you gotta believe that Jesus Christ is the only one who paid for all those sins, past, present, future. And the C is to choose to follow him from this day forward, for the rest of your life. Now you're signing up for a character course, remember. So if that's you, just say that in your heart. Dear Lord, I admit, I believe, and I choose. And if you said that, mark it on your connection card. We wanna know about that so we can pray for you and thank God for you. Others of you, maybe it's time to recommit your life to Christ. If you were honest, You would say on the motorcycle, the adventure bike of faith, you're wobbling, you're wobbling, you're about to go down. You don't understand the no, you don't understand what God's doing. You need to recommit your life to him. Just say, God, I don't understand it all, but I'm gonna recommit my life to you. I wanna be all in. I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna trust you more. Even though I don't like certain things, I'm gonna trust that you have an eternal perspective while mine's temporary. If you said that, God heard it. Let us know if you recommitted as well so we can pray for you and thank God for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord as we hand it back to our campus pastors. Love you guys out there. Please stand. I'm gonna send you off with this benediction that comes from Jude chapter one. And it says, now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You're dismissed. God bless you guys.